Let's go. Books out, phones away, please. Page 27. We're going to continue our discussion from last class. Last class, we went through the Mahloket of the Rambam and the Ramban, if you remember correctly. And we were discussing the connection of Shabbat to Mitzrayim. Yeah. I haven't given it out yet, so I'll tell you. So the connection between Shabbat and Mitzrayim. So the first thing we worked out is the Mahloket Rambam, Ramban. You have to have that argument clear, both sides of the argument, what they're answering how the Rambam is coming along, have his problem with the Rambam, and then his answer to the whole question. That was last class. I'm not going to do that again. It was complicated, but uh, you should have notes on that and videos online. What I want to discuss today is another connection between Shabbat and Mitzrayim. Shabbat and Mitzrayim, because that connection is strongly made. Okay, and what is that connection? So I'll start with a very interesting uh, idea, which I think I mentioned before in the introduction, but we'll go into a little bit deeper today. And that is what's fascinating that the entire world keeps a seven-day week, pretty much. And historically has as well. There have been societies that didn't, but for the most part, everyone is keeping a seven-day week. In addition to that, everyone is following the same pattern, meaning that the weekend is Saturday. I mean, it's like obvious, but why should it be? Why wasn't Tuesday, Wednesday? the weekend, right? What's up with Shabbat being the end of the week? So what we're saying is, this goes back to, the only source that I know for a seven day week is mass separation, creation of the world. There's nothing astronomically happening of a seven day cycle. There's a one day cycle, 24 hours. There's a 30 day cycle, a month. There's a 365 day cycle around the, to do with the, the, the sun, but there's no, oh, there were more than 365, 365, but there's nothing seven day. Right? The seven day purely comes from Masad Bereshit, from the Bible, from the Torah. And what's amazing is that everyone keeps it. So what we're saying is that the seven day cycle is a natural rhythm that goes through the world. Right? There's a natural rhythm that is happening in creation of seven days. Okay? And we mapped that before. It starts over here, and then it goes up, and then up, and then up, and then up, and then Shabbat is the peak over here. This is Shabbat, and Shabbat is the top of that cycle, and then it restarts again, okay? So there's this gradual cycle of going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then back again, okay? What I want to call this for the purpose of this class, this is going to be a beautiful piece of information we're going to share today, really amazing. And what's interesting, this is from a commentary on the Haggadah, which although that describes you see it, Mitzrayim, we said Mitzrayim and Shabbat are connected. And what Rav Reuven Gazovsky, we're going to see in the book now, bottom page 27, is going to tell us is that really Shabbat is the soul of the world. It is the nefesh. It is the nefesh of the Bria of the world. This seven day cycle isn't just random days that are put together, there is a cycle that exists in this world. And the seventh day is the peak, the pinnacle, and that is Shabbat. It's the soul of Olam. And he actually finds a very interesting hint towards this. We have to do this inside if you don't mind. He starts by saying, look at page 27, follow inside. Right? Navika et Derek Rav Ruben Gazovsky, et a kesher, there's a connection, Benius and Misrabla Shabbat, between coming out of Egypt and Shabbat. Remember the last class? Ramban, Ramban. He's going with that. Ha'inyan, shinei shomer Shabbat omachalaya. There is a difference between two types of people, those who keep Shabbat and those who don't. He's dividing the Jewish people, although we don't want division, but you see there's two types of relationship people have with their Judaism, and the relationship is dependent upon Shemirat Shabbat. Shabbat is going to be what defines the Jewish soul and the non-Jewish soul. Okay? If you connect to Shabbat, and he says, really, this is Kishnei Sugi Hashem, this is two different types of people. Their relationship to Judaism is completely different. Shabbat is going to make that difference. Follow inside, it's fantastic stuff. Ha'echad, yesh lo b'chayav echad m'shishim me'olam haba. And I just want to focus on, highlight those words, because I'm going to explain them to you right now. Highlight those words, because I'm going to explain to you right now. There is a Gemara that says, please focus, there are a number of things, are one sixtieth, right? One sixtieth of something else. One sixtieth of something else. Does anyone know this famous list? What's one sixtieth of something else? Yes. 
Sleeping is six, one sixth of death. Right. Sleeping. Sleep is a sixtieth of death. Anybody else? I have to remember this list myself, actually, yeah? You can have a sixtieth of something. Like two sides. Or like not touch your food. Not touch your food. I'm going to hold that for a second. That's not in this list. That is interesting. That works because of this list. So hold that kosher, non kosher. You're right. It's echad b'shishim. But we'll get to that in a second. What else is one sixtieth? Come on. You went to yeshiva, no, most of you? One sixtieth. Never heard this before? Echad b'shishim. What's one sixtieth? Non kosher is true, but I'll get that. That's not in this. We're going to get to that. Yeah. So Shabbat, right, is a sixtieth of Olam Haba. Right? Of the next world. What else? Dreams are a 60th of <laughs> prophecy, correct. A chalom, a dream, right? A chalom is a 60th of nevuah, prophecy. Yeah. But they say that nowadays there's a little... Dreams still have a little bit of Ruhan Kodesh. They're still there. They're still there. Speak to any Sephardi woman who has a dream about something. For her, it's nevuah. <laughs> Always the boy. I had a dream last night. I said, I was dreaming. Oh, it's going to happen. Okay, I'm being serious, by the way. Sleep is there. Shabbat alam abba. Halom. What else is there? I think honey is a 60th of, if I remember correctly, honey is 60th of the man. Fire is a 60th of Gehenim. Hell. Gehenim. What do you mean by one sixty? Very good. So what is one? What is that fraction? So that fraction. Well, let's do the kosher thing now. Well, you all know the famous halacha that if a little bit of non-kosher food falls into a pot and there's sixty parts the kosher food to the non-kosher food, so it's one in sixty, the non-kosher food is no longer tasty. You can't taste it anymore, and that food becomes kosher. You can eat it if it's an actual piece of meat. You have to remove it, but if it's a bit of milk. Falls into a sixtieth of meat, right? You're walking around your house, you're making a cholent for Shabbat, you're having a coffee with milk in it, and you spill some of the coffee into that cholent, and it's now absorbed inside it, and there's a big cholent and a little bit of coffee. It's more than sixtieth to one part. That cholent is kosher. You cannot throw it away. It's bal tashchet. You're wasting food. You must eat it. You might, can't be like, oh, it's disgusting. I can't eat meat and milk together. It's lost it. Why? Because a sixtieth, for whatever reason, Although, interestingly, in American law, um, I believe it's a 50th. I'll explain that in a second when it comes to food production. But a 60th is that trans, trans part from existence to non-existence. It's just the taste of it. It's the smallest piece you can get to where it just goes from existence to non-existence. The close you can have of that thing, that's one over 60. Okay, so in kosher, how does that manifest itself? Once you have more than a 60th, it's gone. 60th is less than 60th, 59, it's still there. So it's just that border, right? It's that layer between existence, non-existence. It's just a taste. A taste means it's just, just there. That's 60th. In other words, sleep is not death, but you're just getting a, right? Shabbat, we'll get to that in a second, all right? A dream is just a little bit of nubo. You're getting just a little touch of it. Not always, by the way, not all dreams. Most dreams are just like nonsense. But, but it has a little bit of it, right? Honey is just a little taste of that thing. And fire is a little taste of the, of the fire of Gehenna. Not literal fire, the embarrassment that comes with Gehenna. And Shabbat is the 60th of Olam Haba. If someone says to you, what's the Jewish view of heaven? Seriously. What is the Jewish view of heaven? The answer, the Gemara tells us, is Shabbat. Shabbat is just the idea of Olam Abba, the future world. Olam Abba, it doesn't just mean where the soul goes to when you die. It means the future world. The world which is actually, actually referred to as Yom Shekulo Shabbat. With that in mind, that little context, let's understand the statement. He just, he just quotes it, but I want to understand it. He says, um, the two types of people, those, Ve'echad Yeshachayev, such a person who keeps Shabbat is actually tapping into Olam Abba. They're having a little bit of Olam Abba. They're connected to Olam Abba. By the way, some people say that in order to get into Olam Abba, you must keep at least one Shabbat. You've got to at least have one taste of it. Right? At least one Shabbat. Right? The more you have, the more mitzvah you have, the greater the portion of Olam Abba. But you must get it. Without it, it's the gateway into. 
into Olam Haba. Okay? And he refers to what's Olam Haba called? Olam Shekola Shabbat. Shabbat is called, Shabbat is called the world that is all Shabbat. That's what, the Olam Haba is called the world that is all Shabbat. Right? But Tomei Chayam, Chayam Zachor. And those who taste Shabbat, he's speaking poetically, get to live it. Okay? Then he says, Chavahu, Sheyesh Shel Kedusha Menucha Lachayam Right? Those who have that, have Tiferet, Greatness, Gedula, Ateret Yeshua, Redemption, all the wonderful things that were promised for those people to keep Shabbat. We'll see more <coughs> as this semester, although we've had a little bit of it already, we'll see a lot more of it. Yom Menucha Kedusha, a day of rest and holiness. We'll discuss Menucha Kedusha later on. The law beyond my Shabbat Levado. Now, this is a mistake people make. People think, well, Shabbat is its own thing. You basically go one day of a bunch of seven, you hit Shabbat, and then you enjoy it, and then you're back, okay, it's a weekday again. He's like, no, no, you're making a big mistake. Making a big mistake. He's like, those who keep Shabbat, since they are part of Olam Haba in this world, I'll say that again, you're part of Olam Haba while you're walking around this world, not just on Shabbat, but actually every single day of the week. Look what he says. Look at the proof he brings down. I would highlight this. It's very likely it will be inside your midterms. Where, where are we? We're halfway down. We're on page 27. Bottom of the page, halfway down. The Leonviyam Shabbat Levado. This is going to have, it's going to resonate the rest of the days of the week. Your keeping Shabbat is going to change you for the rest of the week. Key, Shabbat v'yinafash, it says. Right? Now that is from the Torah. On Shabbat he rested, right? Shabbat v'yinafash. Pirusha, he said, you know what that means? So this is a deeper understanding of the word v'yinafash. Shabbat he hanefesh. See the word nefesh is in there, vayinafash, and he rested. He's saying in the word vayinafash is nefesh, the soul. The soul is discovered on this day, and that is the soul. As he says, Shabbat he hanefesh al olam. It is the soul of the world, not just the Jews. It's going to affect everyone. He says the entire world is affected by this day called Shabbat. Although we Jews are the only ones that keep it. La Allah, according to Jewish law, it doesn't just affect ourselves. It affects the entire world. As he says, It gives power to the rest of the week, Kula, all of it. And it is the source of all blessing, which is going to be the next chapter we're going to do. It, uh, we may reach at the end of this class, possibly. It is the source of all blessing for the entire world. Right? As we sing on Friday night, Makor HaBaracha, in Lachad and that's why we count the days of the week in the following manner. We don't have a day Sunday. Right? Where does Sunday get its name from? Because of the day they worship the sun. Monday was moon day. These aren't Jewish concepts. For us, the days of the week in Hebrew, as we mentioned before, are referred to as chol. Chol means weekday, but literally means sand. Sand because... They have no independent reality, just a grain of sand has no independent reality. It only takes on worth when it's connected with other things, but each one of them has no connection. So weekday is called Chol, right? That's weekday. And Sunday, if you will, is called day one, right? Yom Rishon, Le Shabbat. Then we have day two, Yom Sheni, Le Shabbat, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and then seven is Shabbat. Actually, we don't call it seven. Shabbat is the only day of the week that has a name. Because the rest of the week is being impacted by it. It's being impacted by it. I want to just flip this, if you don't mind, for one second. Please follow carefully, my friends. This is very important information. Every day of the week only resonates as its relationship to Shabbat. Shabbat is the only day with a name, which is the only day that's worth having a name. All the other days are a build-up towards Shabbat. We have a taste of this by an object in the Beit HaMikdash, in the Mishkan. Does anyone know what object teaches us this concept in the Beit HaMikdash? The menorah. The menorah, right. What, are we mentioned this already? Mm -hmm. The menorah was built in a very interesting way, right? It was a stand, a zoi, had a central branch, and then it had seven branches. Okay, where do you go with, by the way, whose design is this? Anybody know? Who goes with this design? This is Rashi's design. The Rambam, which the Chabad Lubavitch, did I mention this already? No. Chabad Lubavitch have the straight ones. Right? So they say that this was the, this was the central 
figure over here, they say this was, these represent the seven days of the week. The menorah represents seven days of the week. The middle one is Shabbat. Okay? And this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? And they say that the wicks on each of one of these was pointing towards Shabbat, a zoi. The flame would actually go towards Shabbat, go towards the middle stem, which is the most important stem. Right? And the flame over here went straight up. And they learn out something very interesting. This is a hint towards it. That actually the first three days of the week, actually let's do it the other way around. This is Wednesday, yeah? This is Thursday, this is Friday. Chol, yeah, the word chol means weekday, but it also means sand because the two are related. Okay, we're seeing there's a, there's a concept that connects them both. This then is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I'll use it in English because it's easier to see. So actually what happens is, and this is true halakhically, these three days, the end of the week, the last three days of the week, yeah, Yom Shishi, Hamishi, Ravi, are connected to the Shabbat that is upcoming. You start preparation for Shabbat on Wednesday. You're ready into Shabbat. The first three, you're actually connected to the Shabbat that came before it. Does anyone know an interesting halakha that relates to both of these angles? There's actually two halakhat. I'll give you two. First one relates to this side, and the other one relates to this one. This is halakha la If you're going on a long journey, you're going on a trip, you shouldn't leave Wednesday onwards. If it's a long, arduous journey, you shouldn't leave like going on a ship because you'll get sick already and you should be praying for Shabbat. You won't be able to enjoy Shabbat. So long, arduous journeys should not happen Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And anyone know halakha that relates to the first three days of the week? Let's say a person comes back Mosi Shabbat and doesn't make Havdalah. Doesn't make Havdalah. You can make Havdalah until Tuesday. Tuesday. Until Tuesday. Why? Because you're still part of the Shabbat. Why would that be? Say, it's Mosi Shabbat. You don't make it. You're done. Okay, you don't make the fire. The fire only happens on Mosi Shabbat, Saturday night. It's the only time you can make Havdalah because the fire was created by Adam and Rishon. It's related to only to Mosi Shabbat. But the rest of Havdalah over a coast of something, you can make again. And you can do it, you can make instead up to Tuesday. If you forgot, you should make it Mosi Shabbat, obviously. Okay? So these part is all connecting to that central stem. And the light of the menorah re reflected, literally, this idea that Shabbat is what we're all building up to or recovering from. Okay? So every day of the week was connected to that thing. Okay? So that's Rav Grozovsky. Yes, Daniela Esses. Um, I heard that it's always good to start things on Tuesday. Does that have anything to do with it? No, that's because of the Torah. Tuesday is referred to differently in creation. What extra word is Tuesday referred to? Kitov, Kitov is mentioned twice in relation to Yom Shlishi Tuesday. And therefore, the custom was to do smachot, um, weddings, and other things on Tuesday. Get married on Tuesday, okay? Because Kitov is mentioned twice in relation to Tuesday. Yeah, it's a good day of the week for, 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 for things, yeah. Which is my, cl my class is on Tuesday. Oh, no, not this class, whoops. Yes? What? You can get married any day of the week. But Tuesday, they say, there's an extra sugala because it says kitov, kitov twice. Well, that's because you have an aliyah to the Torah, so they do it on a day where you can get an aliyah to the Torah. Okay, turn over the page. He's going to go on a little bit. And then we'll share a nice story, which is in my children's... Books, art scroll books, where I read to my kids, but actually has a very deep story. So he carries on and says, top page 28, even though the Shabbat is the nefesh olam, vayinafash, it is the nefesh, the soul of the world, umekor, abrachan, source of all blessing. We'll get to that next chapter. Batsmuta, he says, be very careful. Ein ora, the light of it, the light does not Ziva and the glow Nigalim is revealed El Lashamreya. You want to get something out of it, you've got to keep Shabbat. It's not going to be appreciated by those people who do not keep Shabbat. If you want to get something out of Shabbat, you've got to put yourself into Shabbat and then it'll not only affect your Shabbat, but the rest of the week as well. It's only going to work for those people who are Shomer Shabbat. And remember, Shomer is a code word for <coughs> meaning? Got meaning? Not breaking the Lamatet Malachot. Not breaking the Lamatet Malachot. I, 
Okay, that was a shamor, remember? You've got to know that for your midterm as well. And the zachor is to do the positive action. Can you do that one more time? Sure. Shamor, he says you've got a shamor, which means not to break the, uh, not to break Shabbat. By the way, we'll have a discussion later on of what's better, shamor or zachor. Because the two may play off against each other. And we'll see from Chazal, very interesting, later on, of that connection. Okay, let's keep going. You said get out of it. One second, I want, what? Sorry. Do you have to sit at the back every time you ask questions? Come closer. No, I know. I, I just, I'm starting my... Oh, okay. Sorry. So, so speak up then. Yes, shamor means the God, which is a reference to not breaking the Lama Tet Malachot. Okay. We mentioned that last class. Yeah. So there's a discussion between Caesar and Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania. Caesar approached Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania, and obviously it was Friday, and Friday, everyone's house smells delicious. Delicious. And the smell of this food from the Jewish homes was radiating around, I guess, Yerushalayim, I guess, wherever they were. And Caesar could smell it. And he's like, Why is it that the smell of the food of Shabbat is so powerful and amazing? And he responded and said, He said to him, There is a special spice that we have, phones away please, that we have in our food, the Shabbat Shemo, and it's called Shabbat. There's a special spice we add to our food, and it's called Shabbat. She'anu matilim letocho, which we put inside the cholent, inside the chamin, inside the choresh, right? Inside the... Dafina. Right. Verecho no def, and the smell spreads. Amalo, Caesar says to him, Ten li hemenu. Give me a bit of that. Let me try it. I want to try this delicious smelling food you're cooking for your Shabbat. Amaloi, Rabbi Shubh said to him, Kal, by the way, pretty gutsy answer he gives the Caesar, Kal amishamet Shabbat mo'alo. Only those who keep Shabbat get to really enjoy the flavor of it. But if you don't keep it, it's not going to help you. You're not going to get the taste. The spice is not going to work for you. I know those people who get oneg enjoyment from it. They get to get honor and they will forever inherit it. What a strange conversation. Right? What is this conversation? He's like, oh, what a beautiful smell. What is that? He goes, that's the chillant. That's our Shabbat food. He goes, can I try it? He says, you can, but you're not going to get it. He goes, what do you mean? What's making it taste so good? Because we have a special spice called Shabbat. The food only tastes good. This good. And you're only going to get it if you keep Shabbat. He was using the food as a metaphor. And by the way, a very good metaphor to understand the enjoyment, right? And the eternity that comes with, comes with Shabbat. I'll mention as a side point that the food we have on Shabbat has a higher status. As we mentioned, the food you buy during the week in honor of Shabbat, okay, is considered a mitzvah. Just the process of buying it means you're connected to Shabbat itself. I know people, I know in my house you have lots of kids, it gets difficult, but the food you have on Shabbat should be only for Shabbat, ideally. You should have your best food. Now, we live in a world now where we have so much food, right, that having like meat stew is like, hey, right, but going back, it wasn't like that. But you should, according to your ability, financial and otherwise, you should be getting the best food in honor Shabbat. The better the food, the better it is. Okay? Uh, so in my house, we have cholent, and then the kids don't have it, and then Sunday night, we'll have leftover cholent, which probably is never as good, right? All right? So it's got to be, on Shabbat, it tastes different. A little bit of what he's saying over here. But I know people, I know Rabbi, um, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger from Uptown, I heard one of his classes once, and he said to us that his wife is very careful to make food on Shabbat just enough by Shabbat it's finished, not to overdo it. She doesn't want to mix in Shabbat food with weekday food. So. Now, my family can't do that because we'd have too much left over, right? But there is such an idea. There is such an idea. The food of Shabbat should be exceptional. It's re directly related to Shabbat itself. Okay. There is such an Indian, such an idea. And he's saying you only get the full impact. What's the basic understanding of the Gemara, though? You're only going to get the 
full impact of Shabbat, of this middle stem of the Gemara, the light, by being Shomerit, because only then, which he couldn't, because Caesar wasn't Jewish, he's like, you're not going to get it. It'll be like a nice food. But the real power of Shabbat, the full enjoyment of it, even the food you eat, only comes to the person who keeps it. Only comes to the person who keeps it. That's what he says. Aval hamachal Shabbat, a person who breaks Shabbat, Rachman Aslan, heaven forbid, ibedet nefesh. Right? There's a part of that the Jewish soul is being removed. Right? Who did Shabbat? The Jewish soul. As he says, for Shabbat, so Shabbat keeps your shilachem. Keep Shabbat because it's holy to you. Mechalalei motumat, breaking Shabbat is chav mita. Ki kala osa bo melachav nichrata nefesh. Right? We know that a person breaks Shabbat, their soul is cut off. Right? We care of Amma from his people. Right? Your, your connection to the soul of the rest of the Jewish people comes through your keeping Shabbat. Which is why we said only a Jewish person keeps Shabbat. When a, Jew, when a convert wants to become Jewish, they don't keep Shabbat fully and absolutely right until they become Jewish. Okay? It's so part of our people, it's reserved only for those people who are part of it. Yes? <laughs> you know. Okay, is it possible to complete, to be Shomer Shad, like, all of the laws of Shabbat. That's a very good question. I get asked that a lot. Rabbi, there's so many laws of Shabbat. There's so much to do. Is it possible? So the answer is, I mean, I've been teaching Hilchot Shabbat, the laws of Shabbat here for, I don't know, 15 years. And I still learn new stuff. Okay? So what does that mean? Can you ever really fully keep Shabbat? So the idea is, we have to try our best. Okay? As you learn, you grow, and you have to learn. It is impossible. Impossible. To keep Shabbat without learning the laws of Shabbat. The point? the point is, certain things you can see and watch other people do and do yourself, like <laughs> sukkah, shofar, you walk into a sukkah, you've done it. When I go to a kosher restaurant, you eat kosher food. Shabbat's not like that. You can have two people doing exactly the same act in the same way. One is keeping Shabbat and doing a mitzvah doraita, and the other person doing mechal Shabbat. The same act. Right? Removing one item from another item. It is impossible to keep Shabbat just by watching other people. That helps. But you can't tell. You've got to learn the laws of Shabbat. Right? And that's the only way. So the answer is, you're right. And a person, let's say a person not Shabbat Shabbat. I don't say, you've got to do it all now. You can take it on incrementally. That's okay. And that's actually considered as though you're keeping all of Shabbat. But you've got to be doing something. And you've got to be moving in that direction. Okay? And that's how you become part of the people. Right? So what's the, let's pull in the connection to Pesach, to Yisit Mitzrayim. So go to page 28, halfway down. Ella, Shakot of Ona, Vachem Kushi. He tries to see this. Why is this? Page 29, right? 28, halfway down. Shabbat, Pikoch Nefesh. He's like, one second. How can it be, this is a very interesting question, that you're not allowed to break Shabbat if you are your Chav Mita, Yeah? However, you're allowed to break Shabbat in order to save a life. Pikuach Nefesh. Hear that? Here's a problem, right? He's like, one second. You're telling me that a person's chayv mitah for breaking Shabbat, and yet you're allowed to break Shabbat in order to save a life. It's an inherent contradiction. That's bottom of page 28. Right? How can that be? So he answers it and says, you know what? It makes sense. Because a Jewish person lives in a different plane. Right? We're living in a world of light, of spirituality, with the Vekup Hashem, connection to Hashem. And you are acquiring for yourself a world of eternity through Olam Haba, through Shabbat. By breaking Shabbat, you're testifying, you don't need part of the Jewish people and don't want to pardon Olam Haba. You're showing that your only desire is this world. Right, of physicality, right? Tava regiot of momentary pleasures, ariot, which are temporary, right? Kishor b'mayin or it's like an animal whose face is in the trough. Ruch behemet, a a you show you're basically you're not involved in any form of spirituality. You're just disconnecting and saying I'm not interested in this higher plane. I want to be involved in olam hazeh, and that's all I want. Right? So he's saying you've shown yourself. Right? That you don't want to be connected. You've removed yourself from that spiritual world. However, the person who wants to keep Shabbat, 
but unfortunately, you shouldn't want to keep it, and therefore you can break Shabbat in order to save a life, because that person has shown they're part of the people. Okay. Which is why it's a mitzvah to break Shabbat. We said actually it's a mitzvah for the most religious person available to actually break Shabbat in order to save a life on Shabbat. If there's, one, if there's five people in the room, four don't keep Shabbat, one does keep, he's the rabbi, and someone has to call Hatzalah by the ambulance in order to save a life, Right? That person, the rabbi's going to make the phone call. Why? Because he's showing that life is precious. But life is only precious because we have the ability to do the mitzvot. Right? That's, the, that's the preciousness of it. So by freeing ourselves from Mitzrayim, what we're actually saying is, this is the punchline. I know it's difficult pieces, these. But he's saying by freeing ourselves from Mitzrayim, we were saying we don't want to be slaves, we want to be free. We don't want to be slaves. We want to be free. Freedom comes in one form, Shabbat. Which ironically seems to have the most restrictions, but really that's where our freedom is. The freedom to rise above the physical world and say that I'm not just physical, there's a spiritual element to this world. That's what he says. Look at the bottom of the page. He says it much better than me. Everyone wants to be free. Everyone wants to be free. We all want to be free. Right? We don't want to be slaves. Who wants to be a slave their entire life? Then it's very strange. That people want sometimes to go back into slavery. Right? You know, the Jewish people want to go back to Mitzrayim. Why? Because the food wasn't very good in the desert. Oh, in Mitzrayim we had the better food. We had the avatichim, the melon, and we had the basar, the meat, and the dag, and the fish, and the shum, the garlic. And the batzal, the onions. Why would that be? Why were they left Mitzrayim? Did they complain and want to go back? Because with freedom, with freedom comes responsibility. It's like, um, you see that movie, The Shawshank Redemption? <coughs> you seen that movie before? Do you remember the guy who got freed? He wanted to go back into prison, right? It's, it's, called, it's called being institutionalized. You become so used to being in prison, you actually enjoy it in there because there's safety, right? You know where your mills are coming from and safety. But by going free, you become responsible for your life. Right? It's like, um, like the, the battered wife. Right? He goes through terrible, terrible experiences and then goes free and then goes back. You're like, why are you going back? Because although it's painful, there's a safety there. It's like the person wants to go back to Mitzrayim. The Jews people wanted to go back in. Why? Because the food was better. You were a slave. Why would you want to go back? The food was better? That's good enough? You're free? Because freedom comes with responsibility. We cut your responsibility. Let us go back. Okay, it wasn't so nice. At least we got three square meals a day. We know who we are, and that's the end of it. Okay, so freedom, chayrut, b'nei chorin, means responsibility. Shabbat is a sign of freedom. Shabbat equals chayrut. You see? Can, can, are you following? We're still in this... Coming out of Egypt theme. We left Mitzrayim to become free. They were like, no, we want to go back. Why? We had better food. You're crazy? It's like, no, they're not crazy. There's a certain rationale. Because in Mitzrayim, at least you know who you are, you have your job, and you don't have to be responsible for your life. Right? It's like going back to prison. So Shabbat is the outcome of the Mitzrayim because Shabbat equals freedom. You're not free, you don't have to work anymore, you just get to exist in that world. So Shabbat is the the symptom is the result of going free. It's the sign of freedom for the people. It's the sign of freedom. And it's enjoyable. You get to eat on Shabbat as well. Right? But it comes with responsibility. Does that make sense? Can you see the question of Mitzrayim we did over there? A few blank faces. Okay. By the way, as a side point, um, there are some communities, Persian communities and others, that on Pesach, when they sing Dayenu, what do they do? They hit each other with onions. Have you heard this before? I told you this before? Do you know why we do that? Do you know why some families will hit each other? There's many different customs they have. No, we do that. Why do you do that? It's actually remembrance to this. Because they say, we want to go back to Mitzrayim. We remember the wonderful food we had over there. We remember the shum, the garlic, and the batik, and the melon, and the onions. So we take the, oh, you want this is what you want? So we hit each other with the onions to remind them, oh, this is what you want. Right, you hit them with us, you know. 
I'll give it to you. If this is what you want, this is what, this is what you want to go back for? This is where you want to leave the people? This is where you want to become part of the Jewish people? I leave them Mitzrayim? You want just the momentary pleasures of Olam Hazer? That's not good enough. So Shabbat is the answer to that. Okay. So he says, from here we see, we'll just jump a little, page 29, middle paragraph. And now we understand. Everyone, even a free person, has an element of slavery. You know? Although we left Mitzrayim, you know, you can take the Jew out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the Jew. All right? Well, as I said to my wife, who's from Brooklyn, you can take the girl out of Brooklyn, you can't take Brooklyn out of the girl. Very, very similar, actually. All right? There's a truth to it. There's a little bit of that inside all of us. We're all still slaves, which is why we have to keep Pesach, to remind us you're not slaves anymore. Shabbat reminds us we're not slaves anymore. All right? We don't have to work. Olam Hazet is important for us to do what we have to do but one day a week we testify we're people of Olam Haba yeah that we're people of Olam Haba we are people of Olam Haba right the Nefesh the Nefesh al Olam right and by the way most Jews did not leave Egypt according to the Midrash and Rashi brings it down they just didn't want to so we're not interested in that so four fifths stayed behind Chamushim only 20% of the Jewish people left this shrine if that's taken literally or not it's a different opinions yeah. Right. So the connection between so that's why there's actually a commentary on the Haggadah. He's like the answer to Mitzrayim is Shabbat. So it says, remember Mitzrayim. That was last class. Remember why? Because you're no longer Mitzrayim. You're a free person. Okay. Freedom is not easy. Right. Sometimes it's not enjoyable. Right? It's easier in prison. But that's not what we're made for. As someone put so beautifully, ships are very safe in the harbor but that's not what they're made to do. Yeah? Right. So that's why Yitzhak Mishraim represents freedom for ourselves and for spiritual pursuit. And that's Shabbat. Which is why the Torah was given on a Shabbat. Okay? okay? Can you do that one? Which one? I said a lot today. No, Yitzhia is from getting out of Egypt. Getting out of Egypt does. Getting out of Egypt. We did a lot today. We did 60th, we did Benora, we did coming out of Egypt equals freedom. Okay, truth is though, as he said, we're all still slaves. What are we slaves to? We're slaves to our physical desires, our pleasures, our constant desire for money and wealth. We're constantly like our bad habits. Okay, Shabbat helps to get us out of that. So it separates us from the rest of the people. So our redemption, as he says, coming out of Egypt was our redemption. Just as we say in the Haggadah Shal Pesach, at the beginning our ancestors were our idol worshippers, that's Terach and Avram Avinu. And now Hashem brought us closer to his servitude. So actually, we went from one slavery to another. We went free from Israel, from Paro was our master, we were slaves, and then we just changed ownership. We became slaves to Hashem. Right? But that was voluntary. Hashem took us out of the, um, the uh, travails and hardship of Egypt. Took us out and redeemed us and took us to himself. That is true freedom. The true freedom is represented by Yitziat Mitzrayim. And that's why he says, Shabbat, bottom of page 29, therefore Shabbat lifts us up. So that we don't put ourselves in this constant cycle of work and work. And that came through. Where do we see that? You see it, Misraim. You see it, Misraim is really the proof text, which is why it makes such a big, why the Torah connects the two, and why it becomes a big deal for us as well. Yeah. Didn't Shabbat predate time? Shabbat predate time. Yeah. Shabbat was created when time was created. It goes so, back to the beginning of time, which is why Shabbat appears at Maser Bereshit. In other words, that was this, this part. Time was set up this way. 
the world follows a certain rhythm of one, two, three, four, six, seven, it goes back again. So how can Shabbat be then a cause because of the So Shabbat. Uh, so it goes like this. Let's check this out. Let's just let's formulate this. You see, Misraim is evidence of the human condition of slavery, which is a part of the world. Our beginnings were in slavery. The Jewish people started in Mitzrayim as a nation, as an Am, and we became a nation by leaving Mitzrayim. That's, what we've, that's when it, Jewish Inc. was founded in the Jewish year, in the Jewish year 2448. That's 3,028 years ago when we left Mitzrayim. All right. Oh, but we were founded in Egypt. We were, we were slaves. That's how we started. Right. We started as slaves. When did we become Jewish? When we left slavery. Where do we see that? Shabbat. Pesach too. But Shabbat is the evidence that we are no longer slaves. Because slaves work 24-7, and we're like, we're not slaves anymore. We left Mitzrayim. So Shabbat is the result of this is Mitzrayim. But some people don't like it. Some people don't want to keep Shabbat. So there are other people who want to go back into Mitzrayim. Because Shabbat equals the representative of, of responsibility towards our people. We reach the next chapter, but I don't want to finish class yet. So let's begin the next chapter, and then we will um, then we'll talk about the assignment, which you're all so excited about. <laughs>